Hello there, and welcome to this episode of Sundays with Paul. Today is Easter Sunday, so our theme today is simply, He's Alive. Seemed very appropriate. <laughs> now, most of us have heard the story many times uh, of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, how he rode in on the back of a borrowed donkey, how people waved their palm branches at him in celebration. Everyone cheered and celebrated. It was like this big, massive festival. Everybody was happy. Well, everybody except maybe the chief priests uh, in the temple. They weren't really Jesus' biggest fans. Uh, and they worked really aggressively during that week to try to make sure that the crowd saw Jesus completely differently than, than the way we would like to see him today, to the point that that same crowd who cheered him when he came to town turned into a mob just one week later, just one week later, that same crowd who was cheering Jesus when he entered would be literally shouting for his blood. Walking down the road to Jerusalem Time had come to sacrifice again My two small sons they walk beside me on the road The reason that they came Was to watch the Lamb Daddy, Daddy What will we see there? There's so much we don't understand So I told them of Moses, Father Abraham. Then I said, Dear children, watch the Lamb. For there will be so many in Jerusalem today. We must make sure the Lamb doesn't run away. And I told them of Moses, Father Abraham. And I said, Dear children, watch the Lamb. When we reach the city, I knew something must be wrong There were no joyful worshipers No joyful worship songs We found ourselves standing In the midst of angry men Then we heard the crowd cry out Crucify Him! We tried to leave the city But we could not get away Forced to play in this drama A part I did not wish to play Why upon this day were men condemned to die? And why were we standing here where soon they would pass by? I looked and said, Even now they come. The first one begged for mercy, people gave him none. The second one was violent. He was arrogant and loud. I still can hear his screams of anger hurled at the crowd. And then someone said, there's Jesus. And I scarce believed my eyes. 
man so badly beaten He barely looked alive Blood poured from his body From the thorns upon his brow Running down the cross Falling to the ground I watched him as he struggled I watched him as he fell The cross came down upon his back The crowd began to yell In that moment I felt such agony in that moment I felt such loss Till a Roman soldier grabbed my arm and screamed You carry his cross At first I tried to resist him then his hand reached for his sword So I knelt and took The cross from the Lord Raised it to my shoulder Drug it down the street Blood that he'd been shedding Was running down my cheek led us to Golgotha they drove nails deep in his feet and hands yet upon the cross I heard him say Father please forgive them oh never had I seen such love in any other eye to thy hands I commit my spirit and pray and die. I stood for what seemed like years. I'd lost all sense of time. Till I felt two tiny hands holding tight to mine. My children stood there weeping I heard the oldest say Father, please forgive us The Lamb ran away Daddy, Daddy what have we seen here? There's so much we don't understand. So I held them in my arms and we turned and faced the cross. Then I said, dear children, watch the Pontius Pilate was faced with a tough situation. He had the religious leaders of the, of the Jewish people in Jerusalem that were demanding the death of Jesus. Pilate interviewed him, interrogated Jesus, could not find any reason to execute him, couldn't even really find a reason to imprison him or jail him at all, found nothing wrong with him, in fact. But the Jewish leaders, the, the, the religious leaders of the temple, uh, they would not give up. They insisted that something must be done, and they pressured Pilate into doing something. Well, Pilate took a big gamble. He had this prisoner in his custody named Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was what equivalent today would be considered a terrorist. And he knew that a lot of people had died at Barabbas' hands, and that Barabbas had stirred up a lot of trouble. And there were many who revered him, but 
many more who found him to be a problem. And so Pilate said, hey, I'll just put this choice out there between uh, Jesus, who clearly has done nothing wrong, and, and, you know, just a week ago, everybody was cheering him coming into town. They all love this guy. I'm going to put Jesus out there and Barabbas. I'll say I'm giving you a choice. The people will undoubtedly choose Barabbas, and then I'll be able to let Jesus free, and even the, the rulers of the temple won't be able to to ups, be upset about it because, hey, it's their own people that did this. What Pilate didn't count on was that the religious leaders of the day had significant influence in manipulating the mob that had gathered. Remember, this crowd that cheered Jesus coming into Jerusalem, now one week later, had been manipulated into seeing Jesus as the enemy, seeing his, him as someone who was going to cause them nothing but problems, that someone was going to jeopardize everything that had been built up in Jerusalem and was going to make the Roman rule just come down on them with an iron fist. All this kind of thing. And so as a result, as a result, that same crowd that cheered Jesus coming into town one week later now was chanting and, and saying, no, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. Pilate had backed himself into a corner. He didn't have any other choice. So in order to keep the peace... He sends Jesus off to be whipped and then ultimately crucified. Now, Pilate gets a really bad rap for that. He's, he's the villain of the story. But is he really? Is he really the villain? Because when you stop and think about it, the actions that Pilate took, hmm, probably not all that much different than the actions any politician today would likely make as well. In fact... I would say that the actions that, Pala, that, that Pontius Pilate chose were the same that most people would choose today. When it comes to prioritizing, uh, uh, setting the priorities of our life, we often get things out of line. How often do we place greater emphasis on our own personal goals and just getting ahead than doing what deep down we know to be the right thing? Pilate knew Jesus did not deserve to be punished or certainly did not deserve to be executed in, in one of the most horrible, horrendous ways possible. But still he went along with that because that was a way to keep peace. It was the most expedient option for him. We do the same thing. Perhaps, though none were harder hit by the events of that day, than Jesus' own disciples. See, it's easy to, I think, it's easy to put ourselves in, Pi, in Pilate's mindset because a lot of us are a lot like Pilate. Not very many of us are like the disciples. See, these were individuals who they fully believed in Jesus. I mean, completely, 100% believed in Jesus. They had literally bet their lives on him. They had walked away from the lives they had known. They had turned their backs on their families, on, on the businesses they'd had. They had dropped everything and just followed Jesus and worked with him. They felt like he was the guy that was going to lead everything into triumph. Now, now there was Judas who was in there who was a zealot. And Judas uh, was of the of the mindset that that uh, you know we were going to have uh, Jesus was going to bring kingdom here on earth, and Jesus kept saying, "No, that's that's not what I'm here for." Uh, but still, still, all the other the other disciples as well they 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 didn't fully grasp even at this point who Jesus was. What they did know was they had sacrificed everything to follow him, and now. Now, even though they had expected him to win, he was going to be ultimately victorious because he was the all-powerful son of God, they watched him be whipped, be crucified, and die. And so now, those same disciples who had followed him, who had invested so much of their lives in him, which is not like what many of us do today, those individuals that were so invested in him now found themselves wallowing in, de in des despair and defeat. Gates and doors were barred, no 
all the windows fastened down. I spent the night in sleeplessness, rose at every sound. Half in hopeless sorrow, half in fear the day would find the soldiers breaking through to drag us all away. Just before the sunrise, I heard something at the wall. The gate began to rattle, and a voice began to call. I hurried to the window and looked down into the street, expecting swords and torches and the sound of soldiers' feet. There was no one there but Mary. So I went down to let her in. John stood there beside me as she told us where she'd been. She said they've moved him in the night. None of us know where. The stone's been rolled away, and now his body isn't there. We both ran towards the garden, and then John ran on ahead. We found the stone and the empty tomb, just the way that Mary said. But the winding sheet they'd wrapped him in was just an empty shell. How or where they'd taken him was more than I could tell. Something strange had happened there, but just what I did not know. John believed a miracle. I just turned to go. Circumstance and speculation couldn't lift me very high. For I'd seen them crucify him. And I watched him die. Back inside the house again, all the guilt and anguish came. Everything I promised him just added to my shame for when at last it came to choices I denied I knew his name even if he was alive it would never be the same suddenly the air was filled with strange and sweet perfume the light that came from everywhere drove shadows from the room. Then Jesus stood before me with his arms held open wide. I fell down on my knees and I clung to him and cried. He raised me to my feet and as I looked into his eyes, Love was shining out from them like sunlight from the skies. Guilt and my confusion disappeared in sweet release. Every fear I'd ever had just melted. From the moment of Adam's fall, all creation anxiously awaited the proclamation that would ring through the heavens and shake the foundations of hell. He's alive, he's alive, he's alive and I'm forgiven. Heaven's gates are open wide. He's alive, he's alive, he's alive and I'm forgiven. Heaven's gates are open wide. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive and I'm forgiven. Heaven's gates are open wide. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. May I have your attention 
I want to introduce to you in this corner of the good and the right stands a champion robed in white his height exceeds the heavens his weight outweighs the world his reach reaches everywhere his age is evermore he is higher than the highest greater than the great no one could ever take his crown away he's more mighty than the mightiest and he reigns from above Undefeated champion of love. He left his hometown to enter this arena, raised his hands in victory for me. An angry crowd crucified. This king who wore their crown And they gladly watched the champion going down But I will never count him out For I'm a witness of The day he rose to retain the title Champion of love For he's higher than the highest Greater than the gray, no one could ever take his crown away. He's more mighty than the mightiest, and he reigns from above. He is higher than the highest. Greater mighty than the mightiest and he reigns from above he's the all-time undisputed undefeated champion the all-time undisputed undefeated champion the all-time Undefeated champion of love, of love. Easter is a time for celebrating new life. You know, springtime is underway. Plants are renewed, the dormant animals awaken, even the bugs, <laughs> and Christians rejoice in a risen Savior. May this time be a time for you to personally find a time of renewal and refreshing. Have a very happy Easter. Thank you for joining me today, and I'll see you next week on Sundays with Paul.